We have a fear gauge that looks at the relationship between VIX and the 10-year. It's at its worst levels since 2011, when you had the Eurozone crisis, since the 2015 concerns around China. This is absolutely a peak in market fear. And I think that's why a lot of folks are talking about, and I'd agree with the notion, you don't want to see the Fed panic into cutting rates and seeing a little bit of reassurance that they're going to look through this to the longer term. For longer term, that's actually a good outcome because you don't want the Fed spending its bullets and not having what's left over for something that monetary policy is best suited for. This is really uh, something that you, you'd have to question whether monetary policy is the right policy response to support the outlook. So clearly there are a lot of major question marks still, and this is a moving target, Jeff, including the big one, which is what does coronavirus look like in the United States? But at this point, what's going to be the impact on the U.S. economy? Well, at this point, obviously, as everyone has said, it's too soon to know. But why, obviously, we're at this juncture in terms of taking a new low in terms of interest rates is the spread to other developed economies and moving out from China, moving out from Southeast Asia. And that's the big concern. You already have economic slowdowns projected. Now it's starting to spread beyond simply supply chain disruptions into the Eurozone economy. And so that's what we're concerned about. But when we look at the these historical events, we know that they have endpoints to them, that they're temporary, and that there's a recovery. There's lost growth, and there's lost world growth. And of course, this time is much more impactful relative to, say, SARS because of the growth of China, the growth of those supply chains. So it's a much larger downturn, but it is a temporary shock, and the ability to grow and the ability to come back is still manifest. It's still there. Jeff, you mentioned that your uh, fear indicator was, was sort of pointing to peak fear at the moment. Is that typically a buy signal? Well, it's typically a reversal. So, yes, I, it's too early to say you want to buy here because that's catching a falling knife. But when you look out over a little bit longer of a horizon, those peak levels of fear relative to equity fear and bond market fears are usually not maintained. Whether you're going to buy today or tomorrow, that's a tougher call. But longer term, I think it's important to take a step back. This is obviously a panic moment in markets, and it may continue because we don't know what the spread is. But certainly relative to those historical levels, those are snapback environments uh, as fear recedes and the fundamentals can once again reassert themselves. So, so where are we on the 10-year? 134? I mean, how low can it go? It can go a lot lower. And that's the good news is that it can go a lot lower in that it's playing that diversification role in your portfolio. A little bit of the bad news to that is the lower it goes, as we saw at the beginning of this year, Stocks snapped back after the initial worries, first on Iran, then the initial worries with regards to coronavirus. Bonds never did. Bonds have this asymmetry to them. And the problem on a go-forward basis is that you're running out of capacity, you're running out of room. Not for today, but when you look around the world, part of the reason why the U.S. rates are so low and falling is because the world is looking to the U.S. to provide that hedge. We're the only market left that can significantly decline. Good news is we can significantly decline. Your bond portfolio can offset your equity portfolio. But the more that the bond portfolio has to do that today for the coronavirus concerns and take on that burden from the rest of the world, which doesn't have that capacity, the less you have for the next crisis. And that's a concern not for today, but, but going forward. But to that point, uh, Jeff, the entire uh, German yield curve is negative again. It dipped into that uh, territory uh, yesterday, and uh, we just got confirmation of the first case in Germany, clearly cases in Italy, uh, and the central bank in Europe has very little levers it can pull. Do you think the eurozone is heading towards a recession, and, and what does that mean for the U.S. economy, even if coronavirus doesn't spread here in the U.S.? Yeah, for the, for the U.S., there's spillover effects. There's a temporary quarterly impact in terms of recessionary type statistics from a quarterly perspective. But again, you get the bounce back. In terms of Europe, it may be facing that shock as well. It's a very important production region in Lombardy, in Veneto, uh, in Italy. This is a recessionary shock. And as you point out, as the market well knows, the ability of the toolkit to offset in terms of monetary policy is more limited. That pushes the burden 
burden on fiscal policy, but fiscal policy is a bit more delayed in terms of its timeliness of response. So we'll have to see what kind of fiscal policy response out of Europe we can uh, uh, get for support to offset that recessionary shock. Finally, Jeff, just talk about what signals you're seeing in the corporate credit market. We did see a big sell-off in junk bonds with yields there hitting near three-year highs. Yeah, the, the, the problem for the credit markets, and that's going to be the, the topic we, we discuss here shortly, is that you came into this event with very little margin for error with regards to valuations. Fundamentals are strong. Yes, they're eroding in terms of leverage statistics. But that's been an old story. The bigger problem is that your valuations were at historical tight levels. And so when you have this kind of shock, there's really no room for the corporate credit markets to absorb it. And so almost all of it has uh, been repricing in terms of spread widening. That's the risk that you take when you go for the higher income. And so that's being manifest here. It's a reminder that there's a trade-off in portfolio allocation when you go for income and you reduce the ballast properties. And perhaps investors will reassess that. This isn't the end of the world for the credit markets. And in some sense, there's an opportunity because repricing to a little bit better valuations is going to create some better entry points. But yields are still low and spreads are still tight. So valuation is going to remain a concern in the credit markets. And, and you're not seeing anything recessionary there at this point? Are no, you? we're far, far from recessionary uh, signals there. These are coming off of very, very tight spreads, which is really telling you the opposite. Very strong measures of credit quality being priced in, perhaps a little bit too strong relative to where fair value would say. That's a reflection of investor need for yield and portfolio allocation. And so getting a little bit of balance and rebalance in terms of valuations on a go-forward basis could be a good thing. This is far from the credit market signaling any kind of recessionary concerns.